Swindon is a large town in the county of Wiltshire, southwest England, about 126 kilometres or 78 miles west of London. With a population of about 185,000 people, it has one of the lower crime rates in the country. Sean O'Callaghan was a 22-year-old woman who resided in Swindon with her boyfriend, Kevin Reap. Sean was a bubbly, friendly, caring and loving girl, instantly likeable, beautiful and considerate. On the evening of the 18th of March 2011, Sean had a night out with some friends in the old town area of Swindon. They went out for dinner before visiting two bars, The Spot and Baker Street, after which they went to Suju nightclub. At 2.53am on the 19th of March, Sean was captured on security footage leaving the nightclub alone. She shared a flat with her boyfriend Kevin about 800 metres away from the club but she never made it home. At 3.24am, Kevin sent Sean a text message to check if she was okay. He was concerned that she hadn't arrived home yet. Sean never responded. This was completely out of character, and at 9.45am that morning, Kevin went to the police to report her missing. After taking the report, the Wiltshire police immediately treated her disappearance as a Level 1 missing person investigation. A Level 1 missing person case means police have assessed the person to be in immediate danger or likely to suffer significant harm. They implemented a four-point strategy to investigate the case. They were 1. Locate Sean and safeguard her from any harm. 2. Develop intelligence and information in order to establish her location. 3. Utilise media opportunities in order to support those objectives. 4. Maintain an open mind in relation to potential criminal acts and seek to secure and preserve evidence. Police immediately questioned the friends Sean was out with. They couldn't offer any useful information. They had no issues throughout the night, there were no incidents or suspicious people in the club. Sean simply left the club alone to go home. A check of the security footage showed her leaving the club at 2.53am. She headed up High Street in the direction of her flat. The security footage of other businesses in the area was obtained so they could follow where Sean went. On this footage, they noticed the car repeatedly circling the old town area, driving past the nightclub. The car drove past Sean a few times as she was walking along the footpath. It finally came to a stop on High Street a short distance in front of Sean, about 2.57am. The glare of the car's headlights shone straight into the camera, essentially blocking the footage. But Sean continued walking towards the car until eventually you lose sight of her in the glare. A short time later, the car pulled away and started driving towards Marlborough Road. Sean could no longer be seen. The quality of the footage meant that neither the make of the vehicle nor the registration plate could be made out. It was a breakthrough though. Police believed it very possible that Sean had gotten into that vehicle. The glare of the headlights meant it was impossible to know for sure and impossible to know if she voluntarily got in or if she was forced in. Other investigators got to work on her cell phone records. The text message sent by Kevin at 3.24am pinged off a tower that put the location of Sean's phone in the area of the Savanak Forest. Savanak Forest is about 19 kilometres or 12 miles away. The area of Sean's phone could only be narrowed down to a six and a half mile radius around the cell phone tower. Given she left the club at 2.53am, this meant she had 31 minutes to get to Savanak Forest. The only way she could have got there in time was by a car. Police believed it was the car seen circling Old Town on the security footage. Only a few hours after Sean had been reported missing, police formed Operation Mayan to investigate her disappearance. Detective Superintendent Steve Fulcher was appointed as the Senior Investigation Officer. 
He was an experienced detective who had headed over 50 major investigations throughout his career. The investigation was marked as Category A, the most serious category. Category A means a major investigation of significant concern where any member of the public is at risk, the offender is unknown, and the investigation and securing of evidence requires the allocation of significant resources. And significant resources is what the investigation got. Up to 140 officers were involved. Search teams were immediately mobilised to attend the Savanak Forest. The forest is a densely wooded area with a thick undergrowth. Not an easy place to search. Specialist police and dog units were called in. Superintendent Fulcher had three scenarios running through his mind at this early stage of the investigation. One. On leaving the nightclub, Sean had been either enticed into the vehicle or forcibly abducted into the vehicle seen on the security footage, then driven to the Savanak Forest where she met with harm. Two, she had met with an acquaintance and gone with them voluntarily and for reasons unknown has failed to make contact with friends or family. Three, just because her phone was in the Savanak Forest didn't mean Sean was there. For reasons unknown, she may have become separated from her phone and met with an accident or had harm done to her at another location. A media strategy was discussed with the police media unit and a press release was immediately issued appealing for information regarding Sean's whereabouts. Up to 400 volunteers from the public, as well as members of Sean's family and her boyfriend Kevin, joined police in the mammoth search of Savanak Forest. An anonymous donor offered a $20,000 reward for any information that helped locate Sean. Volunteers also assisted distributing posters appealing for information. Press releases and appeals were also widely shared on social media sites. But after 48 hours, police were no closer to discovering the whereabouts of Sean or what happened to her, other than it was possible she may be in the Savanak Forest area based on her cell phone records. It was three days after her disappearance that a major breakthrough came. An image specialist reviewed the security footage and was able to clear the images up. It was his opinion that the suspect vehicle on the footage was a dark tone Toyota Avenza estate, manufactured between 2003 and 2008. He also noted the presence of a slightly lighter area on the doors of the vehicle, which he thought could be stickers of some kind. Shortly after this information was discovered, a police officer ran a check of the automatic number plate recognition records, the ANPR. This is relatively new technology fitted to some police vehicles. It automatically reads the number plates of all the cars that it passes. The number plate is then checked against police databases. A record is kept of all number plates that are checked by the ANPR. An officer checked all recordings of vehicles between 2.53am and 3.15am on the 19th of March. He got a hit. Vehicle registration AV07 FZF, registered to a green Toyota Avanza estate, caught by the ANPR travelling along Marlborough Road from Swindon Old Town. The vehicle passed a police car heading in the opposite direction. It was registered on the ANPR at 2.59am, only minutes after you lost sight of Sean in the glare of the headlights on the security footage. This information was relayed to Superintendent Fulcher. It was 2pm on the 22nd of March. Police had a significant lead. The registered owner of the car was Christopher Halliwell, and police got to work checking him out. Meanwhile, the search of the Savanak Forest continued. Other police have been analysing cell phone signal strength of the area. Through that analysis, they were able to identify hotspots of the forest where the phone was most likely to be. The hotspots allowed police to rule out large sections of the six and a half mile radius area. So they were able to narrow their search. Around this time, another anonymous donor came forward and offered a further $20,000 for any information to find Sean. That doubled the reward to 40000 It was at 2pm on the 22nd of March that police became aware of Christopher Halliwell. By 3pm, they were conducting covert surveillance on him. 
The reason for the surveillance was recorded in the investigation log as follows. Shan has yet to be found, and surveillance provides the best opportunity of identifying her current location, should Halliwell be prompted to wherever he had left Shan. Christopher Halliwell was a taxi driver, and the police noticed the taxi stickers on the doors of Halliwell's car, in the exact spot where the image specialist believes stickers may be found. And it wasn't long before the surveillance team reported Halliwell was displaying some strange and suspicious behaviour. Twice within a short period, around 5.30pm, Halliwell was seen cleaning the rear passenger seat of his car with cleaning fluid. Later that night, Halliwell attended the local police station. He told the officers there that his daughter had told him she had been raped the previous evening. Shortly after 10pm that night, Halliwell was seen putting car seat covers, headrest covers and a bottle of perfume in a bin. About quarter past two the next morning, 23rd of March, he was seen driving through the village of Warmbra, and not long after he had driven through, police spotted some material on fire on the roadside near the village. Superintendent Fulcher was briefed on the behaviour of Halliwell. His plan was to try and engage Halliwell through media releases, in the hope that this would encourage him to return under surveillance to wherever he had left Sean. Basically, the strategy was as follows. The police would release a statement that evening saying they were getting close to finding Sean. They had deployed specialist dog units to assist the search, but the loss of daylight meant that the search had been postponed and would resume the next morning. A further tactic would be to release a press statement about the green Toyota vehicle of interest, appealing to the public to come forward if they had sighted it around the time of Sean's disappearance. It was hoped that these press releases would increase the pressure on Halliwell and he would respond under the cover of darkness and lead the police to wherever Sean was. If Halliwell didn't respond as they had planned, then they would arrest him at 7pm the next night, 24th of March. They determined that it was highly unlikely Sean would be at Halliwell's house and that they were doing nothing that would jeopardise her life. It was hoped that their plan would result in finding her alive. That was the entire focus of the investigation and the reason for the strategies they had put in place to find Sean alive. Meanwhile, other officers paid Halliwell his first visit. It was about midday on the 23rd of March when they knocked on his door. They obtained a statement from him where he gave an account of his movements around the time Sean disappeared. His statement was clearly inconsistent with what was captured on security footage. But they didn't make a big deal of it. They said it was just simply routine because his vehicle had been captured in the area on the AMPR. The officers also took a buccal swab from him. During this visit, Halliwell was close to tears and visibly shaking. He looked to be highly stressed. It was here that a risk was identified. That risk was that Halliwell may attempt to harm himself. But they decided the risk was manageable and they continued as planned. Officers were put on high alert to intervene should at any stage Halliwell make attempts to harm himself. The police were hoping Halliwell would react to the press releases, but they were disappointed. Halliwell didn't respond at all. It was clear the media strategy wasn't working. Later that night, Fulcher spoke to Detective Sergeant Cooper. He was a Tier 5 interview advisor. Tier 5 is the highest level you can get. His role was to give advice to his fellow police officers on interview procedures. And it was here that Cooper informed Fulcher about the urgent interview procedure under PACE Code C 11.1. PACE stands for the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984. And what that section of the act says, in plain English, is that after a suspect has been arrested, they can't be interviewed about the offence unless they are at a police station or other authorised place of detention. But there are a few exceptions. One of those being if the delay in getting to the station or authorised place of detention would likely lead to interference with or physical harm to someone, then police could conduct what they call an urgent interview. Sergeant Cooper was of the opinion that this was one of the rare occasions that an urgent interview could be justified, as they were still acting with the hope Sean would be found alive. 
This section doesn't change the fact that the suspect still has to be read their rights, as most of you would know it. In England, it is referred to as cautioning the suspect, and it goes like, you do not have to say anything unless you wish to do so, but what you say may be given in evidence. So basically, you have the right to remain silent. Upon receiving what he considered expert advice, Fulcher made arrangements for an urgent interview to proceed after Halliwell was arrested. He noted in his report, quote, When the senior investigating officer directs that the arrest be effected, an urgent interview will be conducted, because at this time I have no means of knowing whether Sean is alive or dead, and I consider this to be an emergency situation which requires measures to be taken to identify her location. Nothing of interest was cited by the surveillance teams throughout the night of the 23rd of March and into the early hours of the 24th. It was just after 10am on the 24th when more suspicious behaviour was observed. Halliwell was seen to place two wrappings in a waste bin outside a store. He then purchased what was described as an overdose quantity of paracetamol. Fearing that Halliwell was going to attempt to kill himself, a plan was put in place to arrest him. At 11.06am, he was arrested in the Walmart car park of Swindon Shopping Centre. Halliwell was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping Sean O'Callaghan by PC Hine, who was working with PC Mullis. PC Hine cautioned Halliwell immediately after he was placed under arrest. He was then put into the police car. Soon after that, two detectives arrived. Derek and Bevan. Detective Sergeant Cooper had prepared a strategy for an urgent interview to be conducted with Halliwell, and he picked detectives Derek and Bevan to carry out the interview, as both were experienced officers. Cooper provided them a copy of the provisions of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which allowed the urgent interview. He also added in these instructions, quote, This investigation is a crime in action, the whereabouts of Sean O'Callaghan are unknown. The senior investigating officer has directed that an urgent interview be conducted immediately upon the arrest of Mr Halliwell to establish the whereabouts of Sean. The questioning is only to establish the whereabouts of Sean and will cease once the risk to Sean's safety has been averted. Any questioning will be recorded contemporaneously at the time. Their urgent interview took place in the car park and was recorded. It went as follows. There was the arrest and caution and explanation of the arrest. Derek then said, The focus of the investigation is to find Sean O'Callaghan. Tell me where Sean is. Halliwell. I don't know. Derek. Can you help us with where Sean is? Halliwell. I don't know where she is. I don't think I should say any more without speaking to a solicitor. Derek, do you know if Sean is safe? Halliwell, no comment. Derek, can you help us know if Sean is safe or not? Halliwell, no comment. Not until I speak to a solicitor. Can I go to the police station now? As far as Derek and Bevan were concerned, the urgent interview was over. The demeanour of Halliwell at the time was described by Derek as looking like a rabbit caught in the headlights. Bevan called Cooper and told him the bad news. Cooper agreed there was not much more they could do and the urgent interview was over. Cooper instructed two other officers who had arrived at the scene to take Halliwell to the nearest police station, which was Gable Cross. Superintendent Fulcher was at the station waiting, pacing the floor. As the two officers were heading towards the station, Fulcher was advised by Cooper that the urgent interview had ceased and they'd got nothing useful out of it. Fulcher reacted. He told Sergeant Cooper not to bring Halliwell back. Instead, he instructed that he be taken to Barbary Castle. Barbary Castle is a historical landmark in England. It's an Iron Age hill fort situated near Swindon, on a site of about 12 acres or 5 hectares of vast fields and hills. Fulcher wanted to continue the urgent interview himself. Cooper didn't discuss this request with Fulcher, he just did as he was told, fulfilling the instructions of the senior officer on the case. 
The escorting officers got the phone call and changed their course from the station and headed towards Barbary Castle as they were instructed. They arrived at the castle at 12.11pm. Derek and Bevan had been told to meet them there as well. Fulcher said the sole purpose of his decision was for it to be a last appeal to Halliwell to give some indication of where Sean was, so as to try and save her life. He chose Barbary Castle as he thought it was the most likely place Sean would be, and he considered it better to take Halliwell to the most likely scene of the crime. Fulcher headed to the scene. When he arrived, he walked alone with Halliwell to a spot about 50 metres away from the other officers present. The conversation went as follows. Fulcher, are you going to tell me where Sean is? Halliwell, I don't know anything. Fulcher, are you going to show me where Sean is? What's going to happen if you tell us where Sean is, that whatever you will be betrayed, you would have done the right thing? Halliwell, I want to go to the station. Fulcher, are you prepared to tell me where Sean is? Halliwell, you think I did it? Fulcher, I know you did it. Halliwell, can I go to the station? Fulcher, you can go to the station. What will happen is that you will be vilified. If you tell me where Sean is, you would have done the right thing. Halliwell, I want to speak to a solicitor. Fulcher, you are being given an opportunity to tell me where Sean is. In one hour's time, you will be in the press. Halliwell, I want to speak to a solicitor. Fulcher, you will speak to a solicitor. I'm giving you an opportunity to tell me where Sean is. By the end of this cycle, you will be vilified. Tell me where she is. Halliwell paused, looked at Fulcher and said, Have you got a car? We'll go. Fulcher's plan had worked. Halliwell remained calm and subdued. As he got into the vehicle with Fulcher, it appeared as though a weight had been lifted off his shoulders. Fulcher sat in the back of the car with Halliwell. Halliwell gave them directions in a quietly spoken voice. The drive took 45 minutes. Halliwell directed them to a remote area about 32 kilometres away, or 20 miles. A quiet, rural spot in South Oxfordshire. Halliwell couldn't locate the exact point, but he gave enough information for markers to be set up for the search teams. They located Sean's body later that afternoon. At 1.20pm, Fulcher informed Halliwell he was going to hand him over to a police constable who would take him to the police station where he would be booked for murder. Upon hearing this, Halliwell said, You and me need to have a chat. Fulcher arranged for Halliwell to be taken to another location, away from the other police. Halliwell then said this to Fulcher. I'm a sick fucker. Do you want another one? Fulcher interpreted this as Halliwell meaning that there was a second victim. However, he did not caution him. He decided to just let Halliwell continue to speak. He didn't want to interrupt his flow and risk him shutting down, which he thought would happen if a caution was issued. If there was a chance to find a second victim, which they didn't even know existed, he didn't want to risk losing that information. This was a quote from Fulcher. I didn't consider it relevant to the moment in time we were in. I believe the right thing was to obtain the information we were going to get, not contain it. Although Fulcher did concede that if they were going on a trip to find another victim, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act required Halliwell to be cautioned. They got into the car again and Halliwell directed them to a field about 48 kilometres away, or 30 miles, near the village of East Leach in South Gloucestershire. When they got there, Halliwell pointed out an area of a 40-acre field, another quiet and remote spot. Police searched the area and found the remains of Rebecca Godden Edwards. Becky was a happy, bubbly, beautiful, intelligent girl. As a teenager, she got involved with the wrong crowd and was introduced to drugs. She left school and her life spiralled out of control a little bit. Her family tried everything they could to help Becky, including putting her into private rehabilitation clinics, 
but the pull of her habit was stronger and she would do whatever she had to to get her next fix. It wasn't unusual for Becky to disappear for weeks or months at a time. After a conviction for stealing in 2001, Becky told her mother Karen Edwards she couldn't keep putting her through hell, so she was leaving and she wouldn't return home until she was clean. Karen believed Becky had moved to Bristol. She never gave up hope that Becky would return home one day. Over the years, Karen was told by sources close to the family that they had seen Becky, but they were mistaken. Karen did try and track her down through the police, hospitals and other organisations, working under the assumption that Becky was alive and well somewhere. Tragically, she wasn't. She was last seen in late 2002. She was murdered sometime between then and early 2003. Fulcher asked Halliwell a number of other questions, still all without a caution. At 3.15pm, Halliwell was taken to the police station where he was formally processed. Halliwell requested the assistance of a solicitor, and one arrived within the hour. Halliwell was then interviewed again. He was now at a police station, in custody. He had been cautioned, and everything had been done by the book. Now was the chance to get everything on record, in compliance with the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Fulcher didn't run this interview, it was handed over to other officers. Halliwell had one response for every question that was asked of him. No comment. Fulcher was surprised, annoyed and frustrated. He assumed Halliwell would continue to talk to the interviewing officers in the same way he had been speaking to him. Fulcher referred to his interview with Halliwell at Barbary Castle as a continuation of the original urgent interview. Fulcher frankly admitted that he deliberately didn't caution him or remind him that he was still under caution. The reason he gave for not doing so was because the key issue was to save Sean's life, and that aim would be thwarted if he opened up the interview by telling Halliwell he didn't have to say anything. He considered Sean's right to life was more important than a Police and Criminal Evidence Act compliant interview. Fulcher said, I felt it was the right thing to do in the circumstances I was faced with. Halliwell was charged with both murders, and he pleaded not guilty. Before the case went to trial, Halliwell's defence team put forward a submission that the questioning of Halliwell was inappropriate and could be considered oppressive and persuasive, and that no caution was issued, therefore ruling all the evidence the police got after Halliwell's arrest inadmissible. If the judge agreed, everything Halliwell had told them and pointed out to them would not be able to be used at the trial. This was argued in what is known as a voir dire, which is a preliminary examination on whether or not evidence will be admissible in a trial. The voir dire was heard before Judge Mrs Justice Cox in the Bristol Crown Court on the 9th of May 2012. This was her ruling, and I've simplified this a little bit so it isn't exactly word for word. Viewing this entire episode, in my judgement, it is at least possible that this was questioning which, by its nature, and given all the circumstances, affected the mind of this defendant and caused him to speak when he otherwise would have stayed silent. For these reasons, I find the evidence relating to this confession and the location of Miss O'Callaghan's body is inadmissible. The Crown accepts that on the evidence in this case, two separate urgent interviews were carried out. And even where Code C 11.1 is engaged, all other provisions of the code continue to apply. A person whom there are grounds to suspect of an offence must be cautioned before any questions about an offence are put to them. After any break in questioning under caution, the person being questioned must be made aware that they remain under caution. If there is any doubt, the relevant caution should be given again, in full when the interview resumes. Failure to caution, even when the police are investigating a very serious offence, but perhaps especially when it is a very serious offence, amounts to a substantial and significant breach of the code. The second interview could and should have been conducted at the police station. The defendant was just a short distance away from Gable Cross and could have been formally processed immediately. 
Instead, Detective Superintendent Fulcher adopted an approach which I consider was deliberately designed to ensure that the protections to which this defendant was entitled were not afforded to him. His decision not to caution the defendant was a deliberate one, precisely because the defendant might have done what he would be told he could do, stay silent. His decision not to take the defendant to the police station for interview was as he accepted because the custody sergeant would have ensured that the defendant was informed of his rights. The defendant's removal to Barbary Castle for the purposes of a further urgent interview would not only have resulted in the placing of additional pressure upon him, but also ensured his request for a solicitor could not be granted. For the reasons given above, I do not accept the prosecution's submission that what happened in this case had no impact upon this defendant or caused him no disadvantage. There were indeed significant and substantial breaches of the codes, in circumstances deliberately designed to persuade the defendant to speak. Further questions were asked, all without caution, during the journey to Miss O'Callaghan's body. Admissibility of this evidence would have such an adverse effect on the fairness of the proceedings that it will not be admitted. The judge ruled against the police and in favour of Halliwell. And because everything relating to the questioning and the finding of Sean's body had been ruled inadmissible, so too was the questioning and the finding of Becky's body. This was massive. Everything the police had after Halliwell was placed under arrest couldn't be used at trial. Without that, the police had no evidence in relation to the murder of Becky. The defence put forward a submission to withdraw the charge, and the Crown had no choice but to accept. Halliwell had just beaten one of the two murder charges, and he confirmed his plea of not guilty in relation to Sean's case. That would still proceed to trial. A few months later, Detective Superintendent Fulcher was suspended, pending an independent police complaints commission inquiry. In Sean's case, the police still had a substantial amount of evidence they could use at the trial. That included further compelling matches on the automatic number plate recognition system, which showed that Halliwell returned to the Savanac Forest area where he had first left Sean. It showed that he scouted out the area where Sean's body was eventually found by police. The media releases had worked. They had spooked Halliwell and got him to move her body. But he had done that before he was identified as a suspect. That's why he didn't react to the media releases when he was under surveillance. He had already moved her. Also, the seat and headrest covers that Halliwell was observed putting into a bin were recovered by the police surveillance teams. The covers had Sean's blood on them. Halliwell and his defence team knew the police still had a strong case. In October 2012, Halliwell changed his plea to guilty. The trial was off. He was sentenced at the Bristol Crown Court on the 19th of October 2012. Mrs Justice Cox gave him a 30-year prison sentence, but then reduced it to 25 years because he pleaded guilty and saved Sean's family the pain and suffering of a trial. But that was little comfort for the family of Rebecca Godden Edwards. After a very complicated and painful journey, over the last 18 months, Sean's family have today had the justice for the murder of their beautiful daughter. However, our family's fight for justice for Becky has only just begun. Police kept Becky's investigation open. They knew who killed her, but they just couldn't use any of the evidence they had. That meant they had to find more. Fulcher's actions effectively ended his career. The inquiry lasted quite a while. At the conclusion, the Independent Police Complaints Commission ruled he was able to keep his job and he was given a warning, but he was found guilty of gross misconduct. The damage was done. He resigned a few months later, in May 2014. Becky's parents had split up long ago and they shared very differing views on Fulcher and the police handling of Becky's case. Becky's father was very critical. He said, I can't explain to you what they have made me feel and what they have done to me mentally. They've got off very cheaply Wiltshire police. 
what they put me through, this extra pain and suffering, nobody has been made accountable for it. But her mother Karen had this to say, it's really going to be such a waste of an extremely experienced detective who I know has solved so many crimes. Had he have followed the guidelines, then Becky would have never been found. She would have never have come into the equation and Sean would have still been where he moved her to. No one would have found Sean in a million years where they found her, where he dumped her body. It was Steve Fulcher's experience. Okay, he bent the rules, but he bent them for good reason. Sean O'Callaghan's family were also strong supporters of Fulcher and his actions that day. Police continued to work on Becky's case. The strategy they adopted for the investigation was to painstakingly map Becky's last known movements. Becky was working as a sex worker at the time of her disappearance. They located a witness who worked with her, and she was able to identify Halliwell as one of Becky's regular clients. They uncovered evidence showing Halliwell was very controlling of Becky, offering her money and making demands she stop working in the red light district. On one occasion, Becky was seen arguing with Halliwell before getting into his taxi. In early January 2003, Halliwell visited a doctor. He had a swollen hand and a scratched face. They also matched soil on tools found in Halliwell's shed to the field where Becky's remains were found. It was painstaking work and it took a lot of time, but they were eventually able to uncover enough new, overwhelming evidence linking Halliwell to the murder of Becky. And that meant they could now use his confession again. In March 2016, police charged Christopher Halliwell with the murder of Rebecca Godden Edwards for the second time. Halliwell pleaded not guilty. In the trial, he gave a story that he didn't know Becky at all. As a taxi driver, he used to turn a blind eye to whatever his customers got up to. He had two men who he regularly drove around, and it became clear to him that they were drug dealers. One night he picked them up. They were carrying a large sports bag, which they put into the boot. He didn't ask any questions, and assumed it may have been weapons or drugs. He drove them to the field where Becky's body was found. Halliwell says that later on, one of the men told him they had buried a sex worker in the field that night. But Halliwell thought he was just messing around at the time. In relation to his confession, which was now admissible, he said he deliberately gave a false confession as he knew Superintendent Fulcher was breaching guidelines and he wanted to do everything he could to destroy his career. Halliwell represented himself during the trial. When Steve Fulcher was called to give evidence, Halliwell told him during his cross-examination, It was a pleasure ruining your career, you corrupt bastard. Fulcher replied, I'm sure. Halliwell went as far to say that he had no reason to lie. He was already serving life with little hope of ever getting out. What he did to Sean was unforgivable and he deserved every bit of his life sentence. But he was innocent in Becky's case. After a two week trial at Bristol Crown Court that only concluded last month, September 2016, the jury reached their verdict in about three hours. We have waited over five years for this momentous day. It has been an extremely painful journey, but today we've received the justice that has felt like an eternity coming for our beautiful little girl, Becky. As the guilty verdict was read out, Halliwell smiled at Becky's family. Judge Sir John William Griffiths had this to say during sentencing. I have concluded both murders involved the abduction of the victim and sexual conduct, and both were aggravated by the concealment of the bodies. I am satisfied your offending is exceptionally high and satisfies the criteria for a whole life term. Halliwell's papers were marked never to be released. Halliwell thanked the judge before being led away. After his conviction, an ex-cellmate of Halliwell's from back in the 80s had this to say. He used to ask me about killing. He said, how many people do you need to kill before you become a serial killer? He just had a thing about them. He wanted people to be proud of him or an area to be afraid of him. 
the officer in charge of the second investigation into Becky's murder, Detective Superintendent Sean Memory, had this to say. I am really open-minded. There is an eight-year gap between Becky and Sean. I would appeal to Christopher Halliwell if he wants to speak. I'm willing to speak with him. I can't rule out there are other victims. He's not forensically linked to outstanding cases. However, that's not to say he hasn't committed other offences. I'm not specifically looking at any one particular offence, but I do want to try and understand why there's an eight-year gap between his offending behaviour. There's a distinct possibility there could be further offences. This police interview with Halliwell is pretty telling. This is when police had uncovered the new evidence connecting him to the murder of Becky, and they were interviewing him about that. I'll get charged with this, and if I'm found guilty, I'll get natural. Right. I mean, not being funny in 15 now, but 25 years to go, so chances aren't looking good as it is. Um, if I wrap this up in the next few hours, any other charges against me that will be brought, there's a bit of past, I think you probably know about various things in the past, there's car thefts, break-ins, bits and pieces, and um, some more serious. Will that, will clearing this up be enough to stop everything else? I don't want to keep coming back every couple of years on a different charge all the time. So what I'm saying is, if I can clear this up in the next few hours, will everything else be forgotten? Because at the end of the day, I'm going to get a sentence to it. I'm just going to go, to go, <coughs> to go turn the lock and say, that's it, you're done. Right, so what's up? saying is, I'll clear, I can, Resolve the matter, but I don't want you coming back every couple of years, every five years, every ten years, whatever. With this, with this, with this, or something like that. As if, if it goes to court and I'm found guilty, that's it. They lock me up, that's right, with the key. I'm under no illusion, I'm not stupid. So that be it. So he's trying to do a deal that if he clears up the murder of Becky, he's going away for the rest of his life anyway so he wants that to be enough to stop any other future investigations or charges against him. He doesn't want to keep going back every couple of years on a different charge every time. Of course the police didn't take his offer and Halliwell ended up pleading not guilty. But that interview seems to suggest that Halliwell thinks he could be linked to other crimes in the future. This is Steve Vulture's thoughts. There's no question from all the information I gathered when I was running this inquiry in 2011 that he has committed other murders. And the one thing Halliwell said to Fulcher during their talks that has Fulcher so convinced is pretty chilling. Halliwell said, The police want to interview me about eight murders. Police are still working on this, seeing if they can link him to any other crimes. The investigation is still ongoing. After Halliwell's conviction for the murder of Becky, Steve Fulcher, who now works as a consultant in Somalia, released this statement. I am very pleased that Karen Edwards has finally seen justice done for her beautiful daughter Becky, who was brutally murdered by Christopher Halliwell. She has fought a very dignified battle for the past five and a half years to bring Halliwell to court, and she should not have had to. I hope she finds some comfort in this verdict. I thank Karen for her resilience and determination to obtain justice for her beloved daughter. Halliwell is an evil and depraved violator of women. I did all I could to find an abducted girl, Sean, in an effort to save her life, the first duty of a police officer. I also recovered a second victim of Halliwell's murder, Becky, returning her to her loved ones after eight years of their misery. I caught a serial killer preventing any further girls being murdered. Halliwell had to be arrested as he was about to commit suicide. As the law stands, the expectation was that I should have prioritised Halliwell's right to silence and legal protection over Sean's right to life. I remain convinced that the action that I took in allowing Halliwell to take me to the bodies of both Sean and Becky was the right and moral thing to do. In doing so, I felt that I correctly prioritised the human rights of the victims and their families, balanced against the rights of the perpetrator. The stance that Halliwell has taken since his confession to both murders, as demonstrated during this trial, I believe vindicate the actions that I took. 
It is perfectly clear that had I not acted as I did, neither Sean nor Becky would have ever been found, and Halliwell would be free to abduct and kill other girls. My actions are deemed by the police service to be acts of gross misconduct. The public will need to know how this can be, and what the police will do on behalf of their loved ones who are missing. When the extraordinary facts of this case are explained, it is likely to lead to a public crisis of confidence in the competence and credibility of the police service. Despite everything that has happened to me, I cannot regret the decisions that I took that day. Ultimately, that decision ensured the return of two beautiful young women, which brought comfort to their families and ensured that Halliwell has been duly convicted of both murders. Now the trial is over and I am no longer a serving police officer, I am able to put these issues into the public domain for the first time. I would like to prevent any family having to suffer the same agony that Karen Edwards has had to endure. I want to ensure that any senior investigating officer faced with crimes in action is able to take the right decision without suffering the repercussions I experienced whilst performing my duty.